19 days in, no speakers, no parameters. The collab clock is ticking, and Jonathan from the next layer is waiting on my design. Would we be able to even pull this off, despite having the tightest budget on the sketchiest speakers I've ever used, with the largest audience ever watching? Would this project put me on the map or turn away a small stadium worth of viewers? Well, if you stick around to find out, we might just work some magic and turn a pair of $35 mystery drivers into a sleek, multi-board compatible monitor that looks pro and fills his workshop with studio-grade sound, while being all 3D printable. Now, you may be wondering, how the hell did I wind up here? Well, a few weeks ago, Jonathan, from the next layer, reached out and wanted to collaborate on a project. I'm a yes man, so naturally I said yes. And after a bit of back and forth, I found out he wanted a 3D printed speaker enclosure for a project video. Much like this, except not like this. We had a much different plan in mind. And I thought that should be a cakewalk. Not knowing that my normal speaker dealer wanted a literal arm and leg to ship to him across the ocean. So we settled on some questionable speakers from AliExpress that had promising pictures of response graphs and their description. They, however, lacked the TS parameters needed to design full range driver. And now you see why I need those speakers so bad. Without them, I might as well tell Jonathan to find a 3D printable cube, cut a hole in it, and just send it. But a 3D printable cube wasn't an option at this point. Plan B, find some way any way to measure his speakers remotely. In a state of panic, I tore through the internet looking for any way that Jonathan could pull TS parameters remotely. I found a few ways, but the results shown looked suspicious at best and or far too tedious to communicate over a video call. And that's when it happened. I got an email saying my package had been delivered. You know that mini Christmas feeling you get when you get a package? Multiply it by 10. I had to share the amazing news and scheduled another meeting with Jonathan to go over designs. Cue disaster number two. Jonathan is one ocean and nine time zones away. Midnight for me is morning coffee for him. Communication was going to be limited, so it had to count. And one late night meeting later, we had a plan. He wanted to go in the direction of uniformity with his recent adoption of the multi-board environment. With that, we are going to convert a multi-board bin into a speaker enclosure that he can mount anywhere in his workshop. What did I get myself into? Those bins are for screws, they're not for sound. You guys see the problem here, right? Storage bins as speaker enclosures. What? So, I'm locked into a specific volume. I have to have a front-facing vent as it mounts on the wall and a request to make it look and sound amazing. This just got a whole lot harder. Our late night call also uncovered another deal breaker. We're using totally different materials with different acoustic properties. We'd be printing in totally different things. If you've ever knocked on plastic or wood, you know each one rings slightly different, and that's a nightmare for speaker tuning. It's something you're not supposed to do. You're never supposed to change materials on a design. So I'm using PETG carbon fiber, and Jonathan's mixing carbon fiber PLA, wood, and CNC acrylic. Will these even sound remotely close? To top this off, my original design called for five liters, five liters of internal volume net. This bin is giving us just over three and a half gross. Most sane people would have called it right here, correct? But stubbornness and experience, mostly stubbornness, says there's a chance. So here's my best shot, crammed into 10 seconds. Twenty two hours of printing, almost support free, except for that damn twisty dice, and about 650 grams of filament on the line for this project. Quick check here. 
Did I make the right call pressing ahead, or should have I bailed as soon as we strayed further from the plan? Leave me a comment below on how you would have handled this situation. Now, if you don't want to mess with customs drama like me, use someone like PCBWay who has their business together. They offer custom PCBs, 3D prints, and CNC work. So you can build a storage bin speaker like me and Jonathan, even if you don't have a printer. Check them out at PCBWay.com today. Use the link in the description for $5 credit on your first purchase and get started on that DIY project today. Ready for some of that magic? For the full build feature, you're gonna have to go watch Jonathan's video. Link below. I'm in charge of sound, he's in charge of assembly. However, it would please the algorithm gods if you would continue to hang out with me until the end and subscribe. That would be really cool as well. So let's get to those sounds. A quick DAT sweep nails the box resonance at 155 hertz. That's a bit high for a standalone box, but a single 6 inch or 8 inch woofer would complement it nicely. Let's fire up REW and see if it tells the same story. On screen, we see from 80 hertz and up, you're sitting around 90 decibels, and the loudest bump lands right where Dat's warned at 155 hertz. So even as a standalone box, you would fill the base that Jonathan wants for a workshop. The rest of the curve, shockingly flat for a $35 driver and tweeter pair. Just one little dip at two and a half thousand hertz, which you could nudge with an EQ if you really cared. Are you ready to hear it? Give me about a minute to explain the 3200 hertz crossover, why you need it, and how it splits the heavy lifting, and then we'll go for that playtest. So a crossover is built out of electrical components that have different effects on the frequencies of AC voltage, mainly its capacitors and resistors. The one I used was pre-built for a 3200 hertz crossover, so below 3200 hertz, it sends full strength signals to the woofer and attenuates all the other frequencies. This is exactly opposite for the tweeter leads. Woofers are used for low frequencies, as a frequency is defined as the rate at which something occurs or is repeated over a particular period of time. In our case, it's oscillations per second or hertz. Knowing this, we can see how a heavy woofer could be troubled when it's expected to move back and forth at 5,000 or even 10,000 hertz. So we use tweeters, which are built out of very, very light materials, or sometimes even quartz crystals, that can vibrate at very high speeds without distortion. However, the drawback is they don't have enough mass to create large enough sound waves at the lowest frequencies, and can lead to distortion there. So we have to divide that work up in two specialized work cases, and that's the lesson for today. Now, on to the short playtest. I'm sure Jonathan will have a playtest on his video, so check that out as well. Link in the description. And without further ado, I present the playtest of our collaboration speaker.
So from the constant uphill battle that was the completion of this project, I think me and Jonathan came up with not only a very unique addition to the multi-board environment, but also a surprisingly quality sounding speaker worthy of any workspace shenanigan. As such, this video will draw to a close, so like and subscribe if you enjoyed the journey and want to see more. After my first collab, I'm excited to see what future collaborations look like. And now is the point where if you are still with me, go watch Jonathan's video. The link's in the description. I know that's exactly where I am headed, as I'm curious how he's been getting on with the files I sent him. So until next time, later.